Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us. My name is Dan Hamilton. I'm a professor here at SAIS at the Foreign Policy Institute. And uh, we run a uh, program, a postdoctoral program, which works on uh, US, Europe, and world order in uh, very tumultuous and historic days 30 years ago that influence how that world order evolved. This year, uh, I mean, this week we're commemorating President Bush. Uh, but this week, 30 years ago, tomorrow, in fact, Pre uh, Soviet General Secretary Gorbachev gave a speech at the United Nations that was quite historic. It was right at the time when uh, Ronald Reagan was still president, but George H.W. Uh, Bush had just won the election and was the president-elect and vice president. Uh, they met uh, after the, uh, Mr. Gorbachev's speech, they met with him on Governor's Island uh, in New York. And uh, the speech itself was uh, quite important in terms of its content. Um, but the context of the times is very instructive, I think, for us uh, today. And that's why we wanted to have this event today to try to look behind the scenes now at what was the context of the, uh, Mr. Gorbachev giving that speech, what were the reactions in the U.S. administration at a time of our own transition uh, between different administrations, and, and to have some greater insight into the context in the Soviet Union at the time. Um, Gorbachev was welcomed to New York as sort of a, a rock cross between rock star and uh, Lady Diana. Uh, <coughs> And, uh, and so, you know, it was really quite a big event. But at home, he was increasingly perceived as a beleaguered sort of imperial leader uh, in desperate need of some foreign uh, successes to compensate for some domestic setbacks uh, happening within the Soviet Union. And the UN speech was a sort of a bold attempt to make a virtue out of some necessity and to use Soviet limitations at the time to enhance Moscow's global influence. But the speech itself, just to, just to recall a few uh, bullet points, as we would say these days, uh, he announced the end of Moscow's nine-year intervention in Afghanistan. He stated the Red Army would be reduced by 500,000 men within two years. Uh, he would withdraw 50,000 troops and 5,000 tanks from East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. He declared that, quote, freedom of choice, unquote, was a, quote, universal principle, unquote, and that, quote, force and threats of force should no longer be instruments of foreign policy. So we'd like to know about the speech and its agenda. We'd like to know how it was received uh, at back home as well as uh, here. And as I said, what the Reagan and then the, and, and then the Bush administration uh, was m made of this offensive, that he, this peace offensive he was putting on the table. Um, what's the context of that? So we have a great lineup to help us uh, today uh, th go through that. So first, uh, down at, at the far end, uh, Andrei Kozarov, the former foreign minister of Russia, obviously active at the time, but <clears throat> very pr prominent uh, later. Um, uh, Pavel Palashchenko, who was the principal English interpreter for Mikhail Gorbachev and Edward Shevardnadze during that entire uh, period is in, in all the meetings. Uh, Tom Simons, who was in the State Department at the time, uh, really in charge of the Soviet uh, portfolio, uh, later uh, came, became U.S. Ambassador to Poland, was in charge of U.S. assistance to the, to the East, uh, and has had an extensive uh, career as a U.S. Uh, Foreign Service officer dealing with Eastern Europe and Russia and the Soviet Union. And then my colleague, Christina Spohr, who is the Helmut Schmidt professor here at SAIS, who is finishing a book on the international history of the end of the Cold War, and has been deeply immersed <laughs> in all of the details. And she wants to know every detail so that her book gets it right. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's a great context for us. So I've asked the speakers if we could uh, make some brief opening comments. Uh, and then we'll come into a sort of moderated discussion, then uh, also turn to you at that point. I'm going to start with Minister Kozarev to lead us off. Please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here in, and uh, in, in that company. Uh, Christina is looking into details and knows as much 
more and much better than I. And I, I can only share with you some probably historic anecdotes and superfluous uh, um, impressions uh, which I still have from, from that time. That uh, speech of Gorbachev uh, was meaningful in my uh, <laughs> career uh, because uh, I was then maybe deputy um, chief of international organizations, mostly UN uh, department in the Soviet foreign ministry. And of course, uh, it was uh, kind of on our department to prepare uh, the uh, notes and everything for, for that um, speech and for the visit to the United Nations. And um, uh, after uh, the event, after Gorbachev spoke, uh, it was considered tremendous success by definition. And uh, uh, I got uh, a special kind of uh, recognition from the top of the Soviet power at that time uh, from the Politburo of the Communist Party, and uh, it was kind of a paper, uh, very, very um, highly appreciated at that time. And soon after that, I got a another promotion. So uh, actually, Gorbachev helped me I tried to help him with his speech, and he helped me to get uh, promoted. Uh, thus, I made a career from a, the lowest, the, 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 the junior clerk, which I started 17 years before, or 16 years before, to the chief of that department, UN department, after the speech. Uh, after that, uh, my... <coughs> Um, uh, my uh, interests changed uh, considerably. As you know, I went to the Yeltsin camp. Uh, uh, so for me, speaking of my Soviet uh, career, it was epoch. But it was an epoch, uh, to my mind, for Gorbachev's uh, policy and for his uh, tenure uh, altogether also. It was time when the perestroika, so-called perestroika, that is more or less like attempt to modernize uh, the Soviet economy and the Soviet society even, uh, it was reaching the highs. It was still uh, quite popular in the Soviet Union and abroad. Uh, but um, and his foreign policy uh, was also was received at least in the West, as far as I know, with a little bit of skepticism, but as a great opening. Soon after that great uh, speech, um, things started to change. Um, to my mind, uh, Gorbachev started to hesitate whether to go further uh, on the line of real reform. And uh, uh, in that sense, he was overtaken by um, or uh, challenged by uh, newly uh, developing uh, democratic forces. And that's why, actually, I left the Soviet government for the Yeltsin government a little later. And... Uh, uh, after that, uh, economy also started to stagnate. <coughs> and uh, after that, the foreign policy became more and more like uh, unilateral uh, concessions in order to get some more recognition and probably some credits, also financial support from the West. And actually, that announcement of those uh, of cuts in the military force, which were mentioned, relatively quite sizable cuts, that was already the beginning of that process of making ill-conceived, uh, though correct. I mean, generally speaking, historically speaking, it, it was correct, but it, it demonstrated to us 
the civilians <laughs> in the foreign ministry and even to many generals who were not that kind of proficient in, 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 in those matters, in international matters, and I believe to, to the Russian or to the Soviet at that time population, it revealed that the Soviet Union was hugely overarmed, hugely over militarized and could easily dispense like 5,000, 500,000 troops without any kind of damage or without any kind of suspicion uh, of losing the security uh, to the West. I mean, <laughs> what, what kind of, of, of a country and what kind of politics? Especially since before that, till the last day, the Russian delegations, which I uh, was also engaged because our department was engaged also in disarmament negotiations. Before that, uh, we insisted in, in negotiations with the Americans, uh, we insisted that we could not move a soldier because it was just a, a parity and it should be kept, the parity, the, the, the security of the motherland, of Mother Russia, and so on. And then it turned out that Gorbachev announced those uh, radical cuts without any kind of change of security situation. So, um, unfortunately, I see the uh, speech in positive terms, but as an apex uh, of the uh, Gorbachev uh, policy. Thank you. Pavel. Um, <coughs> I, I think I would have to um, somewhat disagree that Gorbachev's speech was just making a virtue out of necessity um, the arms cuts and all the other things that he did that because at that time he already was in battle on the home front. As Andre has said, at that time he was still very popular in the Soviet Union. He had uh, uh, support from the Politburo for the speech. Uh, people like uh, um, Secretary of the Central Committee, the number two person in the Communist Party, Yegor Ligachev, for example, said numerous times in meetings of the Politburo that we are overarmed, we are over militarized, we must uh, cut uh, our armed forces. And of course, uh, when the speech was prepared, all the military numbers uh, were discussed with the general staff and were approved by the general staff of the armed forces. So um, it was not like making a virtue out of necessity, but it was, I think, uh, an effort to take this opportunity of speaking at the United Nations in order to show very significant changes in the philosophy of foreign policy, in the conduct of foreign policy that by that time had been approved by other members of the Soviet leadership. Gorbachev was definitely at that time the leader and the initiator of um, changes at home and in national affairs. But as I said, he made sure that the proposals that he took with him to the United Nations, actually not proposals, but <coughs> initiatives, that they had the support of the entire Soviet government, and they did. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, what was important about that speech was not just the uh, announcement of uh, cuts in the Soviet armed forces, the withdrawal of some of them from Eastern and Central Europe, but also some of the philosophical points that he made in that speech. And it is, I think, because of those more conceptual points that uh, Secretary of State Schultz, as he later recalled, said after the speech, you know what, this is the end of the Cold War. And this was before the completion of Soviet patrol from Afghanistan. This was before the withdrawal of ultimately all Soviet troops from Eastern Europe. This was before the actual unification of Germany 
before the test that uh, the end of the Cold War had to go through when Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, was a situation where before, given the treaty between the Soviet Union and Iraq, the Soviet Union probably would have supported, at least to some extent, Saddam Hussein. This time that was not the case. So before all those things, right after the speech of uh, Gorbachev, at the United Nations, Schultz concluded that the Cold War was at an end or coming to an end. And I think he was right. When we look today at many of the points that Gorbachev made in that speech, I can tell you they were certainly revolutionary for the Soviet foreign policy. Let me just quote one uh, uh, remark, one sentence from Gorbachev's speech that struck me and my boss, Viktor Sukhodrev, who also was the interpreter for the previous Soviet leaders, and at that time she was deputy head of the USA desk <coughs> so the ministry, so we did the preliminary translation of Gorbachev's speech um, at, at the foreign ministry on the 11th floor of the foreign ministry. And I mean, we both said, listen, this is an amazing sentence. And the sentence that I will read from the translation is, our ideal is a world community of law-governed state, states, which also make their foreign policy subordinate to international law. If there is a definition of what is called here a liberal world order, that is it. That is it. And it is phrased here as an ideal, as something to which the world should strive. And uh, this was quite revolutionary for uh, a Soviet leader to say. Uh, let me quote some other things that he said uh, uh, at that time. Um, he said, it would be naive to think that it is possible to tackle the problems tormenting mankind with the aid of the means and methods which were used or seemed suitable before. He also said, uh, that the development at another's expense is outdated. In the light of the present realities, there can be no genuine progress, either by infringing the rights and liberties of men and peoples or at the expense of nature. Basically, the introduction to the global problem of the environment. Um, the very tackling of global problems requires a new quality of cooperation by states, uh, regardless of ideological and other differences. And many other similar things that I think are relevant today. Uh, certainly, some of the uh, things um, in the speech may look uh, a little outdated because they still bear the hallmarks of the Soviet ideology. But um, I think that most of it was really new, was really different, and a lot of it is uh, very relevant today. For example, he used there the word demilitarization of international relations. This has been his theme for the past, I would say, 30 years. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I am still with him. I've been helping him with some of his... with interpretation, also with some of his interviews and uh, uh, the, the op-eds um, that um, he has published recently. And this theme of demilitarizing not just international relations, but demilitarizing thinking, demilitarizing politics, demilitarizing um, the minds of people, I think this, this is something that is very important. It's not happening today, so he was speaking and is speaking in terms of, as I say, ideal. But it's a very noble ideal. And I think that what remains today from that speech and also from generally what happened around that date and, of course, the meeting between Gorbachev, Reagan, and at that time President Bush happened at Governor's Island uh, a few hours after 
the earthquake in Armenia, the news of the earthquake in Armenia was received when Gorbachev was going to the UN. But then, when she was going to Governor's Island, uh, the uh, motorcade was stopped because there was an urgent call from the Prime Minister, from Prime Minister Rishka. And so she went to the communications car that followed uh, his car. And she talked to Rishkov, who told him about the magnitude of the disaster. And this was mentioned also during the uh, talks between Gorbachev Reagan and Bush. And um, both Reagan and Bush immediately said that we are prepared to give whatever help is needed. So all these things, I think, make the entire day, the entire, and, and also that Gorbachev immediately decided to return to Moscow to skip the visit to Cuba and Great Britain that were planned on the way back, and immediately to go to uh, Armenia. All of that make uh, this whole story and that whole day uh, not just very memorable, but I would, uh, again, use this word, but a very noble day in, in world history. Thank you. Thanks. I should also note there's an uh, uh, op-ed by Mikhail Gorbachev and George Shultz in the Washington Post from Tuesday. Uh, about the dangers of a new arms race. Okay, uh, Tom. <coughs> I'm, I, I don't come here very often, so I, <laughs> I'll use the mic. I don't get to wear a suit very often either I, uh, up at Harvard. I was in the General Assembly when Gorbachev gave his speech, and uh, I was electrified, uh, sitting there listening and listening to these amazing statements, these amazing offers roll out. Uh, I'd been dealing with uh, Soviet affairs uh, in the State Department since 1981, probably longer than a lot of other people uh, at that point, uh, through all the ups and downs. Uh, with Pavel, I was the note taker at the last meeting uh, at Reykjavik. He was the interpreter. Uh, the afternoon that it broke down. Uh, I had been with Reagan uh, in May of 88 uh, during Reagan's visit to Moscow uh, at the Tsar Pushka uh, in the Kremlin where a British journalist, it was British and not American, uh, asked him about the evil empire. And he said, without missing a beat, that was another time, another era. And the hair stood up on the back of my head, I must say. Uh, Gorbachev's speech, uh, the, the promise to reduce half a million troops in the Red Army and the reductions in Eastern Europe uh, was another thrilling moment. And yet I have to say, looking back, that it had very little impact on U.S. policy toward the Soviet Union. Uh, that sounds counterintuitive, but I think uh, it's true. Andre Kozirev and Pavel have given us a sense of where it fit within Soviet policy. I think George Shultz captured that as he writes in his memoirs. He attached himself to the philosophical changes that convinced him that the old Cold War was over. But I like to spend a couple minutes on where the speech fit within our policy and why so little changed. Uh, it came as a surprise, but that wasn't the reason. Uh, after three years of dealing with Gorbachev, we were used to surprises. Uh, it wasn't the first. Uh, nothing could have been more surprising than those amazing offers at Reykjavik uh, to reduce offensive nuclear weapons in return for limitations uh, on SDI. The previous December in Washington, at the end of the process that my colleagues have uh, described, uh, hinted at, uh, we signed a treaty to eliminate intermediate range nuclear uh, missiles. Uh, it's a treaty that's now uh, in trouble. But it was a treaty that, uh, it was a concept, the double zero, that Reagan had proposed in November of 1981 and that the Soviets at that time had dismissed out of hand. Who could have imagined that we would get 
to that point. Uh, now, w when Gorbachev decided on coming to the UN and making this uh, amazing speech, uh, he evidently, this is according to uh, Anatoly Chernyayev's memoirs uh, and uh, to Dobrynin's memoirs also, he really decided to do it only in November. And although he had been talking about over-militarization and the need to reduce forces for a while, it was only in November that he really engaged the Politburo on these tremendous reductions and only uh, got them into the speech. And they came to us very late in the schedule. I mean, they, our, our president and our president-elect were very happy to meet him, uh, but it was very late in the schedule. We had no idea what would be in the speech. Uh, so the overall context was his desire to reduce military expenditures, to, to make a cut at this over-militarization by making international commitments, which would then need to be honored domestically. I think that is the concept. But I think probably most Soviets were as surprised as we were uh, even if the Politburo had heard about it a couple weeks before and approved it. Now, many of them also found it more problematic than we did. Uh, Dobrynin, well, he was in the Central Committee by that point, in his memoirs, contrary to what George Schultz felt about it, that it was a major, it could be a major turn in history, what Dobrynin bemoaned was where are they going to put all these troops? Uh, where are they going to put all these uh, troops and where are they going to house them and how are they going to resettle them? In other words, not the philo philosophical part, but the intensely practical part of what it was going to mean. Now, I also followed Poland. It tends to get left out, but what was happening in Poland at that point was that you had, the Soviets had not yet formally declared the Brezhnev Doctrine dead. They, Gorbachev at the, in his speech said the use and threat of force in international affairs is illegitimate, but there had been no formal renunciation of the Soviet obligation to defend socialism uh, where it existed. He talked about respect for political systems and respect for choice. That was another way of saying those systems stay in place and we don't want you fooling around there. But there had been no formal renunciation, and I followed Poland. So I was thrilled at the reductions in Eastern Europe that he announced because I, it was, they were sure to make the Brezhnev Doctrine harder to enforce if the decision ever came to try to enforce it again. And sure enough, days uh, after uh, Gorbachev's speech, the communist, Polish Communist Party, the ruling party in Poland, and Solidarity, the trade union, which was still illegal in Poland, agreed to roundtable talks, which were sure to lead to some kind of power sharing, the first power sharing in Eastern Europe since 1948, an almost immediate uh, follow-on step uh, in Poland. And yet, pleased as we were, we saw no reason to alter our policy approach to the Soviet Union in response. Partly this was because we'd grown complacent. We were so used to nice surprises coming from Gorbachev, the Gorbachev leadership in the Soviet Union, <coughs> surprises that seemed to validate our policy of negotiating from strength. After all, the, he also announced the final withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan, which was coming in about two months' time. Uh, the good things just kept coming. They had been coming, they kept coming, so why, we asked ourselves, should we change? Actually, we didn't ask ourselves. We felt no incentive to change our policy uh, in response. And there, but aside from that, there were other reasons too. Just before Reagan's landslide re-election in 1984, uh, George Schultz, Secretary of State Schultz, had gone to Santa Monica to the newly set up Center for Soviet Studies 
in Santa Monica and had finally torn our policy away from its bondage to linkage. Our approach to the Soviet Union, beginning with Nixon, following through Carter, and for a while, had been uh, marked, I should put it, scarred, uh, by the concept that Kissinger loved that we should trade things the Soviets cared about for things that we cared about. Uh, Schultz had replaced that with the concept that the two superpowers should identify to each other the things they really cared about. And those that they, uh, where their interests met in this identification, they should negotiate. Where their interests did not meet, they should continue to contest and compete with each other. It was much more straightforward and as a result of that, after KAL, for instance, because we felt arms control negotiations were in our interests, the president decided, despite his outrage at what then looked like an intentional Soviet atrocity, decided to send the arms control negotiators back uh, to their negotiations because that was in our interest. You don't stop doing what's in your interest because of some outrage at something else that happens. Now, this took time to permeate U.S. policymaking, this idea, but by the time Gorbachev gave his speech, it had. And none of us involved in the process saw any reason to change our approach in order to reward him for moves that he obviously judged to be in the Soviet interest, or otherwise he would not have made them. And there was another secondary reason, which uh, Pavel has alluded to, and which became clear at the subsequent meeting on Governor's Island in New York Harbor. We were in a presidential transition. Uh, both President Reagan and, Vice Pre and uh, President-elect, as Vice President, I should say, uh, were at Governor's Island. Uh, and Bush was determined to keep his powder dry uh, for when he became president. There was suspicion uh, on his side that Reagan had been over-accommodating uh, too, too anchored to Gorbachev's personality, and he really uh, wanted to fashion his own policy uh, when he became president in another month and a half. Gorbachev spent that meeting, I think Pavel will confirm this, spent that meeting trying to get Bush to commit himself to everything that Reagan had done with Gorbachev. And Bush was evasive, really did not let himself be trapped in, into, a, there was a final very weak post, toast, which Gorbachev said, this is our first agreement. Uh, but it actually uh, wasn't. It was sort of uh, wishful thinking. He knew what was happening. Now, we had planned, Gorbachev had planned not just visits to London and to Cuba, but we had planned a kind of a happy, a happy goodbye tour of the U.S. Uh, for him, taking him around interesting places. And... <clears throat> But then, because he was informed uh, on the way uh, to the UN about the awful earthquake uh, in Soviet Armenia, uh, he announced on Governor's Island that he would curtail uh, and return home to deal with it. But he explained, he had a little word of explanation for what was happening, and he said it with a snarl. He said, these local political politicians in the Soviet Union are using nationalism to increase their leverage over Moscow. They're using it to bargain with Moscow. And with a snarl. Uh, now, I'd watched local nationalism popping up uh, in Kazakhstan in 1986, very sleepy kind of population, uh, in the Baltics where they were singing themselves uh, independence, and even in sunny Georgia. And when Gorbachev said that, I'm, I got to deal with nationalism because it's being used as political weapon between the, the uh, republics in Moscow. I said to myself, Mikhail Sergeyevich, we love you, but you really have no idea what you're up against. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, Christina's working on all these issues, is deep in it, and uh, I'm sure has questions and her own comments, please. Yeah, so thank you very much. Can you that one? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for all your um, comments and statements, and um, I thought perhaps we can take it in, you know, in two steps, because I think um, Pavel made very clear how from the Soviet perspective how important the speech was, and also in terms of, he pointed us really in terms of the language to certain um, aspects that truly mattered, one of which was this issue of values, universal values, um, not just the aspect of um, demilitarization. And yet, of course, the Eastern Europeans were also listening very carefully because the non-application of the use of force, in other words, of course, almost entailing the abolition of the Brezhnev doctrine, the one thing they were always looking for, um, was kind of implicit in it. And then, of course, the, the other new universal topic that kept coming up at that time, um, in part in the West, also through the Green Movement, was, of course, that we look at, at the planet as a whole. Um, not just at the politics. And as, as we have heard, of course, through the whole Reagan-Gorbachev diffusing in the Cold War, in particular in relation to arms control, we were at a moment of cooperative spirit. Um, one could perhaps call it also a kind of cooperative um, bipolarity. And yet it's very interesting to hear, Tom, what you said that, you know, so there's a speech and people genuinely were electrified. I mean, Gorbachev was treated like a rock star. He got out of the limo on Fifth Avenue in front of cats. There were lots of pictures being taken. Um, there were even impersonators, and actually Trump fell for one of them. He went downstairs and shook the hand of somebody who wasn't Gorbachev. So there's all sorts of funny things going on in the background on that day. Um, you know, and the Trump. Americans were very, very... Um, e excited. Um, and yet at the same time also, as you highlighted, then there is this Governor's Island, the sort of final goodbye summit, which perhaps, you know, it, it didn't entail, say, a crowning moment of signing start, and it was also including um, this, uh, this um, new president. So my, my, f my first set of questions, which I want to sort of throw um, to, to the panel at large, is a bit talking about the speech. I mean, when a speech is, is meant to go for maximum imp impact, and of course it's in the UN by the Soviet leader, uh, and the atmosphere is you know, very excited and everybody's wondering what will he say, um, perhaps we could talk a little bit more about you know, what were exactly his intentions and those of his entourage. Perhaps a little bit you could illuminate um, to us you know, who really worked with Gorbachev on these different ideas. And did, you know, today we talk a lot about when speeches are written. You know, is there a speech writing team or, or, or did he um, <coughs> pick certain aspects <coughs> himself and, and write, write them himself? And then the, the sort of second layer before we maybe later talk about the actual um, summit on Governor's Island, um, and that, that t sort of ties us over a bit more also in the period of the years that, that follow, this aspect of values and this aspect of convergence between East and West so that there was ability. I mean, Gorbachev presented this speech and he talked about universal values, about international rules, about international law. Later, you will remember, once Bush is president, we also have a speech in the context of the Gulf War about, you know, not the rule of the jungle, but international law, and there's these high hopes for the UN to be a sort of kind of world policeman. And yet, in Malta, one year after Governor's Island, there's a lot of debate between the two sides. Um, is there a convergence towards common values or then they discuss or democratic values or universal values, however what you want to call it? Or is it, as Bush throws into the room first, more that the Soviets are actually converging to Western values? And, you know, I, I, I raise this point because from nine, late 1992 onwards, and then you have heard it a lot today, there has also always been talk about Russian values. So perhaps we can talk a little bit also about the language that really also matters in these speeches. So can we go back to our, our Russian colleagues? Uh, just a, maybe some more context, as Christina said. Who, who really put the speech together? It's interesting just to know how something like that comes about. Was it a bureaucratic product? Was it Gorbachev himself with his team? Who was, you know, who's involved in that? Um, and any other insight you could give on sort of the thinking, uh, the context of the speech? <coughs> <coughs> Yes, uh, 
language matters, the words matter. Uh, when I only joined as a fresh graduate um, the foreign ministry, uh, my superiors uh, told me, uh, like, you know, introductory, a joke uh, about the uh, Khrushchev speech at the UN, which they witnessed, like I witnessed them, Gorbachev. And uh, those were two speeches of the uh, Soviet communist uh, leaders uh, to the UN. And uh, the Khrushchev speech was marked, uh, if you remember some, some problems, you remember, was marked by this wood mm, uh, knocking or wood pounding uh, on the podium uh, in the UN. So they said when the speech was prepared mm, uh, by the speech writers for Khrushchev, um, he didn't like it. So he wrote his own version, uh, handwriting. And next morning, he presented it to uh, the Politburo. And um, the reaction was that this is a new word for the global for, um, communist movement. And it's um, just a revelation of the new philosophy of the, uh, what was called at that time peaceful coexistence. It was actually uh, the wording of uh, Lenin himself. So believe it or not, but all that time, including starting the Second World War in conspiracy with Hitler, it was all uh, within the peaceful coexistence uh, definition of the Soviet Union. Uh, so, um, uh, the, the speech which Khrushchev presented uh, was praised, but uh, he said, no, guys, it's impossible. There should be something, uh, some correction or something, you know. The, even the sun has uh, some black spots. And uh, uh, one of those said, yeah, yeah, you know, there is technical grammar, actually, issue. Um, crooked imperialists <laughs> is uh, two words. And um, uh, enemies of the peoples are three words, not one word. So that was the correction to his uh, uh, speech. I, and of course, the uh, Gorbachev speech was uh, considerably different uh, words matter, <clears throat> but not as much, uh, to my mind, because um, everything which Gorbachev said, probably genuinely believing, it was like lecturing the converted. It was lecturing the West on uh, basic kind of norms, which the West more or less observed and more or less is observing or has been observing at least few the very recent times. It remains to be seen uh, what happens next. But so far, uh, so I mean, uh, what mattered though were the actions, the deeds, not uh, talking the talk uh, with all due respect. Uh, to Gorbachev and to, to the UN speech, but uh, walking the walk. Uh, I don't know who actually put together, I, I think it was done in the Central Committee. He's, he's very able, some of them really gifted uh, aides, uh, whom I uh, was privileged, uh, had the privilege to meet at that time later on. Uh, but uh, one uh, portion, one phrase. We also did in the foreign ministry our draft, which, which, was, no, which was then uh, very, very significantly modified. But in our draft, uh, we were fighting, me, uh, I mean some of my friends, couple of my friends, and my humble self, we were fighting with our teeth, so to say, for one phrase. That was <clears throat> 
that the Soviet Union uh, fully appreciates and adheres to the Universal Declarations of, Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the General Assembly. Actually, this document was adopted under Stalin. It was 48, I, I believe. And uh, uh, that it contains everything uh, like, almost like the Constitution of the United States, everything, like uh, first, uh, you know, uh, Bill of Rights, more or less. Uh, but Stalin uh, abstained that is also to the worth of the wording, of the words. Stalin abstained uh, on the declaration, but not because it was too, uh, going too far with the human rights and demo democratic principles, but because it was behind the Soviet Constitution at that time, in 1936, approved in 1936 under Stalin, and after that, came 1937 in the Soviet Union when millions of people were uh, just eliminated to dust in gulags. So that's so much to the wording. But we were insisting on this uh, declaration um, and in Politburo that phrase was challenged. That, that what, uh, as much as I know, that Shevardnadze told us so Severnadze uh, summoned uh, the group who was writing our um, foreign ministry draft and said, guys, we need, I, I am on your side, but it's challenged, so prepare uh, overnight for, for, for the morning argumentation. And we prepared argumentation, and the, the, the best argument was that it was anniversary of the declaration that the Soviet Union voted for the declaration that was unanimously approved uh, by the General Assembly, so it's quite a legitimate document, nothing new, but why, why not um, uh, recall it in the speech? Okay, uh, so that stand, Shevardnadze was able to um, keep the, this phrase. But why we wanted this phrase uh, to be there? Because after that, we were in charge of preparing so-called returns, the analysis of the reaction, of the world reaction to a great Gorbachev speech. And uh, of course, we um, made to for Politburo. It was like three to five pages of documents. Uh, and we, uh, all of those documents um, after his speech uh, were, of course, very, very, um, exuberant and uh, said that yes, it was the, the new world and it was new philosophy for the world um, affairs and all that. But again, like uh, even uh, the sun has black spots, what the Western uh, critics say that the declaration of, of the human rights uh, refers to freedom of speech, not glasnost, but freedom of speech without any kind of censorship and, uh, and other things. So uh, for, for his, one of his next speeches, uh, probably domestic or, or foreign speeches, uh, we insisted that, uh, proposed and insisted on that proposal that he will say uh, exactly freedom of speech, that the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, will be freedom of speech rather than glasnost, because glasnost was kind of liberalization of uh, not, not a freedom. And again, it was challenged in the Politburo. And Shevardnadze, uh, I, I have deep respect for this um, guy, so he uh, again fought, again we prepared all kind of uh, argumentation, he won the day again in the Politburo, <coughs> and later on, I don't remember exactly when, but, but some s s down the road, Gorbachev said in, in one of his speeches that, yes, in accordance with the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
I declare freedom of speech in the Soviet Union. These words really mattered uh, in the Soviet Union because immediately the liberal groups, the democratic oriented groups, and uh, some of um, uh, uh, pap some papers like Moscow News at that time, they started to publish everything. And when they were kind of reprimanded or um, uh, censored, uh, they said, no, no, I mean, look what the leader said. The leader says that it's freedom of speech, and freedom of speech means not glasnost, limited, but it's unlimited. Whatever um, comes to my mind, I publish. So uh, that really worked. Then KGB, that, that we knew for sure, but, um, they uh, challenged that. They said, wow, that you are playing with words. It's just a, he said, yes, but we still have orders. So we again <laughs> made a report saying that uh, the Western media and the Western politicians, they uh, notice that there is a difference between, between what Gorbachev says and what happens on, on, the, on, on the ground in the Soviet Union, that the KGB continues to follow old orders, secret orders, of course, for censorship. So uh, after <laughs> another round of um, uh, you know, commotion there in the Politburo, the um, decision uh, and the Gorbachev issued the order for the KGB to stop really censors. <coughs> so that was tremendous uh, achievement uh, of this speech coming from the speech to the UN, and uh, that was uh, the, the, the game change uh, for, for the Soviet Union. Pavel, you want to add? <coughs> uh, well, I would just add that, that actually I think that it was a process that had been underway before the Gorbachev speech to, so far as I remember, for example, the Gulag Archipelago was published uh, in Novi Mir that had the circulation of about a million copies uh, before Gorbachev's speech uh, at the UN. So the process was underway. Certainly, you know, the kind of discussion and fighting about words and language was important, and uh, the story that Andre uh, told about the kind of interaction between speech, generally, you know, international speeches and domestic developments, that's important. But as I said, uh, the, the movement, the progress toward uh, a real freedom of speech and the end of censorship was underway starting, I think, in uh, 86, 87. Mm -hmm. The difference between glasnost and freedom of speech uh, yes, I mean, many people thought that Glasnost was uh, kind of freedom of speech light. Uh, not quite. Glasnost also included, I think, the idea of more transparency in government, that the government should be more open, should be more transparent. That was actually the, the way that word was used uh, before the revolution uh, in the 19th century. People were uh, the liberal intelligentsia of that time were calling for glasnost. So the use of that word by Gorbachev starting in 85, that too was a big step forward. So things were developing, things were evolving in the Soviet Union even then. And they were evolving um, in just one direction, uh, the direction of a more liberal and a more democratic Soviet Union. Of course, the actual movement toward democratization could only start after the relatively free elections in uh, 88 and uh, 89. Uh, but a lot had happened even before, and Gorbachev's speech reflected that. The speech was put together ultimately by Anatoly Chernyev, uh, Gorbachev's uh, main assistant for uh, international affairs. Um, uh, Georgi Shachnazarov, another assistant, also participated very actively in working on that speech. Many elements of the um, drafts that were produced by the various departments of the foreign ministry 
uh, including Andrei's department, were used in that speech. Uh, Gorbachev, uh, uh, of course, dictated certain talking points that should have been included in that speech. Chernayev actually describes the process of work on that speech uh, in some detail in his uh, memoirs. I think that what struck me also about that speech was how little Marxism-Leninism there was in that speech. I mean, very, very little. And frankly, you know, saying that this was just because the Soviet Union felt the need to ease the burden of the arms race, that it felt that it was losing the competition with the West, etc. That's one thing. But the other thing is that by that time, actually, uh, the, the, the thinking of not only you know, most of the Soviet people, but also of the Soviet leadership was becoming increasingly free of that burden of ideology, Marxism, Leninism, of the idea that, for example, peaceful competition is a form of class struggle in the international arena. That used to be, uh, used to be actually uh, the language that had been used before Gorbachev and Trevor Nazi. Peaceful coexistence is not real coexistence. It's a form of class struggle. Mm -hmm. And I remember the meeting uh, uh, of ambassadors um, uh, in, so far as I remember, 86 or 87, where Trevor Nazi spoke. And uh, uh, I, I was there, I don't know why, because I was a very junior member of the staff. I had just been transferred from the translation department to the USA desk. And my boss, my immediate boss, was in Geneva at the negotiations. So that's why I participated. It wasn't just ambassador, but senior staff. Even though I was junior, uh, I was there at that meeting. And, and Shepard Nazi spoke rather vehemently against that whole idea of peaceful coexistence as class struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Ambassador Kronowski was there, others, uh, how they applauded. Uh, so, there were changes happening in people's minds. Words are important because they reflect changes in people's minds. Words are not everything, but they are important. And I think that uh, uh, the value of this speech today is that it also shows what was happening um, in the minds of people, people like ordinary people, people like uh, advisors to Gorbachev and Shepard Nadze, and people like Gorbachev and Shepard Nadze themselves. It was a process of very rapid change in, in the mindset of many, many people. Not of everyone, but quite a few people. Then, of course, there was this thing that Andre mentioned in the very beginning, how he went to Yeltsin, that Yeltsin was more radical, that Yeltsin was more democrat, etc. Et but that was preceded by the, what they sometimes call the tectonic shift in the minds of people. And I stayed with Gorbachev, he was with Yeltsin, but basically that change happened in the minds of many, many people. I would say at that time, certainly majority of the people in the Yeah. So, Tom, you might want to add into that, but I think uh, let's try to wrap that into, I think, Christina's second piece here, the rest of the day. Yeah. So the speech was really important, but this was also a major summit, uh, and it had to do with the future of this relationship, not just ending the relationship with Ronald Reagan, but beginning one with a new president. Um, and I just wonder, uh, Christina, why don't you uh, lead on some of that, that uh, part of the time? In some ways, maybe you <coughs> when you answer, Tom, you can also bring a bit back how it sort of, what did Americans imagine could now happen? There was that speech, you said you were electrified, and of course, on the one hand, the Governor's Island Summit was, you know, happy goodbye for Reagan, but then in the background, when one reads the transcripts in the, somewhere more to the side, is sitting the new president, the incoming President Bush, um, and um, I was wondering whether you could bring back a little bit for our audience and for myself the mood. What was it like, the mood Gorbachev had with Reagan? They had known each other now already for many years. And of course, um, Bush, who is now going to be the new president, what were the expectations, what were the hopes, um, what, and what did Americans <coughs> think um, this transition would perhaps bring, given they had just been landed with this speech? What, what did they imagine? Where, where will we go in the next year or two? Yes. 
Uh, it's just um, uh, very, very connected to that question. Uh, my question, uh, what would, what could be or should be uh, the American uh, responsive action to Gorbachev's speech? You, you said that, Tom, you, you said that uh, there was no response. But what should <coughs> or could or would be? be yeah. yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. how might we understand where then Bush was coming from as he watched this and was about to take over, but was yet not in charge? Of course, it was Reagan's show. Well, well, Reagan, no. Reagan was a, an affable icon. I mean, I think it was an important summit, but it was important for the tonalities of it. I don't think we expected a lot of business to be done, and I'm not sure the Soviet side expected business to be done either. Gorbachev was after some kind of positive tone, uh, and Bush, I think, gave him that. Bush had supported the Reagan approach to the Soviet Union and, and, and told him that and said, you know, he favored the achievements of it, but he was not going to commit to continue everything that Reagan had done. So there was a kind of a tentativeness about the atmosphere there. And Gorbachev, I don't think, got what he wanted. Now, Andre just asked, what should he have gotten? And I don't think he could have gotten anything more than he did get because of the way American politics and American policy are structured. And that also has to do with the reaction to the speech because uh, Americans, of course, have an ideology, but it's, it's, it's buried deeply in a way that it was not in the Soviet Union. I mean, Schultz appreciated the importance of the philosophical part of Gorbachev's speech, but that's partly because Schultz had been trying to uh, do a tutorial for Gorbachev on the way the world was changing and, and appreciated the, that Gorbachev had been responding to this and was changing his own thinking. Uh, but, but Americans always have a lot of trouble with words and deeds. I mean, we're able to fight like tigers, just as the Soviets fight like tigers. And we've had a wonderful lesson in that from uh, Andre and Pavel talking about how the speech was in the struggles over peaceful coexistence. And those are important. And I knew that because I dealt with the Soviets long enough to know that uh, ideology was uh, an important foundation stone of the regime, and people really believed in it and therefore fought over these words you know, because it, they had consequences. Words were consequential for the Soviets, but now in a way that they weren't uh, usually for us. We could fight like tigers over a word like laboratories at, at, at mm -hmm. Reykjavik. Reykjavik. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that was one word. I remember Reagan wandering around the basement of the ambassador's residence after that, you know, shattered by the failures, and, and the way he explained it, because he thought symbolically, was just one word. He kept repeating, just one word. So we could attach ourselves to words also. But in general, partly because we didn't understand what was going on in the Soviet Union. I can remember the discussions of, in, the, in the summer of 1982 over how to react to, to Brezhnev's death which was coming on, what should the American reaction be? And there were proposals within our government that we should try to influence the succession. You know, we should favor such and such a candidate for the succession, but, but, but then we all agreed that we don't know enough, we're not smart enough, and we're not adept enough to try to influence the succession. So what we should do is stick to the definition of our interest and keep working on our interests and make sure we understand what the Soviets think their interests are. In other words, that George Shultz concept that I gave you a little earlier, but before the letter. So we, we respected what we didn't know about what was going on inside the Soviet Union. And that's one reason we were kind of hesitant and, and tentative. Uh, usually, the, the other solution was we want deeds, and not words. So Gorbachev has had this magnificent speech I mean, he, he had a magnificent set of proposals in early 86 for the abolition of nuclear weapons and uh, half reductions of strategic weapons and big reductions of conventional weapons. But I said, you know, that's an that's a election speech after the election. I mean, that's a platform. That's, that's, 
the equivalent in our uh, electoral process is a party platform, but you do it before you're elected. Gorbachev was doing it after he was elected to prove he was a great leader. So you had all these things out there, but to us, they look like propaganda. I mean, they look like something that was intended for domestic and international audiences, and, and so we were waiting for changes in negotiating position. I wrote a book about the, my first book. It's called The End of the Cold War with a Question Mark, which came out in 1990. And I said in that that the Soviets are always looking to build a roof before there are any walls. And the Americans are always looking to build walls before there's any roof. And I called it a bricklayer's song, because that's what I was. We, we lay bricks and, and let the overarching agreement on principles or ideology, that's for later. Or, and we don't take it as seriously. And I think that's what happened to our approach to, to Gorbachev's speech at Governor's Island. I mean, mm -hmm. we heard it, it was great, but you're, going, you're not gonna make any commitments here for a next administration and you're gonna wait until the administration to see what the Soviets are actually doing. Are they reducing troops? Are they changing uh, positions in arms control negotiation? That's the acid test. Now, I think we were talking earlier, the Bush administration waited an extraordinarily long time before engaging uh, with the Gorbachev leadership uh, in 1992. So that should have been the that should have been the that reaction. That should have been the response without that pause for reflection that yeah. Bush announced when he yeah. became president. On the one hand, he wrote a good letter to Gorbachev, sent it to the microphone. Uh, on the one hand, he wrote a good letter to Gorbachev uh, in uh, late January, right after the inauguration, mm -hmm. sent it with Henry Kissinger, who sure. was in Moscow with the Trilateral Commission. On the other hand, on the same day, Bush announces that the administration needs a pause for reflection about the overall strategic situation. And uh, basically, it meant that there was a loss of momentum in our relations with the US that lasted up until the visit of uh, uh, Baker, Secretary of State Baker, in early May 1989. So uh, in answer to Andre's uh, question, I think a good uh, response would have been um, engaging with uh, Gorbachev and Sherman Nadze right after the inauguration without waiting for several months to review the overall strategic situation and ultimately concluding that, yes, we need to engage with Gorbachev. I mean, uh, you know, Rose Ridgeway, for example, told me a couple of times later that it was totally unnecessary and that she believed that the kind of allegation that some of Bush's people made about Reagan, that he was uh, Too naive, uh, et cetera, about Gorbachev, and that there was a need to review everything, that this was nonsense. But that was, uh, that was the case. Well, I chaired both the review processes that spring, both of, toward the Soviet Union and toward Eastern Europe, and they were basically holding up. But it, the, where there was action forcing events, like the successful conclusion of the Polish Roundtable uh, in, in April, uh, there you got into fights over how the United States should respond to this major step forward by a communist leadership uh, in Poland. And we still had people arguing uh, that none of it's serious because the police are still there and the military are still there. And, all the power agencies are still communist, so, so uh, this is uh, superficial. Uh, and so you still had that, uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets too. What you got was a, a standby, but she's right that it didn't need to last that long. Yeah. Uh, let me just add, I think that generally what it means that actually there were changes underway in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, uh, already in 87, 88, and that uh, the United States, my view, uh, it basically underestimated the, the magnitude and the direction of those changes. Not in Eastern Europe, but in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is fascinating, but I want to also make sure anyone from the audience who wants to contribute uh, has a chance before we wrap it up. So I'm going to collect a few comments. We have a microphone.
Uh, if you could just say who you are and then uh, and then ask your question right here, Terry. Terry, who are you? Hi, I'm Terry Hoffman from the Contract Management Program here at SICE. Um, I've followed the MBFR CFP negotiations uh, pretty much every year, uh, interviewing uh, delegates between 1974 and through CFE in 1992. And uh, about the time of the Gorbachev speech, there was also a very significant change in the whole approach to those negotiations, which basically broke the stalemate that had been going on from the very beginning because of NATO's focus on manpower reductions and uh, the Warsaw Pact's uh, focus on uh, armaments. And uh, about the time of that speech and the, and the Gorbachev withdrawals, we also had really a complete reversal of the NATO position, at least the basic fundamental principle of focusing on, on armaments, tanks, artillery, combat aircraft, and so forth, rather than, than troop limitations. And between 1988 and 1990, we negotiated what I think is the most complex arms control agreement ever negotiated, uh, in part because of the legacy of the earlier failed negotiations. But nonetheless, uh, I, you know, I, my, my question, therefore, is first of all, was Gorbachev sending a signal to these negotiations that uh, by changing the force structure in Eastern Europe, that uh, NATO and particularly Germany and the United States might be able to reverse their prior opposition to, uh, to, the, to the Warsaw Pact position. And, uh, and, and to Tom, I mean, how much did Washington uh, kind of see this as a signal or, 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 a, or a basis for essentially uh, changing the NATO position uh, on, uh, on conventional arms control in Europe? Okay, now so, since we only have a brief amount of time, I collect a few comments. If our speakers just note what these questions are, don't feel that you have to uh, answer each one, everybody. But uh, let's just collect a few others. And please make these very brief. I'm not saying that, Dieter, because you're next. Yes, thank you. But you, you are next. <laughs> right. And who are you? Um, I'm Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. <coughs> and my question is, um, uh, how inevitable do you think the collapse of the Soviet Empire was? Was there a different way? Possibly. Has it been discussed? There was, of course, a Chinese model. And, and I would be interested in you know, alternative ways for reforming the Soviet empire. I mean, Gorbachev took the enormous step of going full force to Western values, values and policies and all of that. Was there a different way discussed? Okay. Can and I? Could that have been more successful? Let me ask, is there a SICE student here? And they, yeah, right here. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Piotr. Um, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know if I can maybe take the discussion slightly more looking forward. Um, my briefly, concentration briefly, is, yes. Uh, st st <laughs> strategic studies. Um, I wouldn't exist if what Gorbachev had gone through and done uh, had happened, because my father came uh, to be with my mother after off the Cold War collapse, so I owe him quite a lot. Um, but yeah, my question is basically, what will it take to get um, that kind of condition, those circumstances again in the future? based on what we saw in 1988, and, and more of a progressive relationship between right. Russia and the West. Okay, so you have uh, free reign to speak about the future now, or today, not just the past. Uh, I think we have to just come back now because we're going to run out of time. So let me, uh, let me go in reverse order, if I can, because Christina might have anything else she wants to add. Well, I, I could um, answer something that um, Dieter asked. Basically, of course, the Chinese were very worried about the Eastern <coughs> European contagion, as they called it, and it was something where they reprimanded the Soviets also. When Gorbachev went to Beijing, they sort of said, you know, you're doing it all wrong. You're trying to do everything. You shouldn't do political liberalization because that's all going to end in disaster. So I guess that's where the values thing again comes in. You know, they, they chose the way where they would keep their state together. And, and that meant, of course, um, from their perspective, that they had to crack down on political opening. And Gorbachev had taken the principled view that these two things had to go together. And by that, he opened processes that were much more difficult to manage. I think in particular, if you think <coughs> of nationalities and the, 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 the makeup of the Soviet Union as a state. Yeah. Uh, could I add just a word to this? I think when they say that the Chinese model ultimately proved more successful than Gorbachev's mm -hmm. model, they mostly mean, I think, the economic transition. And the economic transition in China uh, took some time, which historically it turned out Gorbachev did not have. The Chinese started their economic transition in 78. By 1988, 
when Gorbachev came to China, the transition was still in its infancy. It was not yet the kind of bustling China, which is the engine of the global economy that it was already in 2000. So it's very complicated. When we talk about the empire, that's a different question, because the empire is basically the fact that, unlike China, the Soviet Union was a state in which Estonia and Turkmenistan coexisted within one state. Whether any state that has such different republics can survive historically is a big question. I think it can. But of course, the transition from a state that includes Estonia and Turkmenistan to uh, newly independent states could have been done differently, could have been smoother, and well, it would take us hours to discuss <laughs> this. But, but as I said, when they compare the Soviet Union and China, there are two levels of comparison. One, economic reform, and the second one, just the existence of those totally disparate republics, you know, Stalin's addition of the Baltic states to the Soviet Union, as well as the addition of what used to be parts of Poland to Belarusia and Ukraine were poison pill gifts to the Soviet Union. May we without, continue that, to, without that, I think things could have been quite different. We could continue that part of the discussion and the anniversary of Tiananmen next, uh, next summer. Uh, Tom, any? For Terry, I think MBFR and CFE were kind of a blip on the screen. I mean, the positive Soviet moves were, were part of the new norm uh, of that time. So I don't think that we took them as signals of some larger uh, movement in Soviet policy. They were part of where Soviet policy had been moving, which we welcomed uh, and applauded, although we're not willing to pay for. I think that uh, came up a little later on. Uh, I don't know. Whether there was another way is actually a question for our, our Soviet, ex-Soviet friends here. Uh, I wrote a book, my little book in 1990 posited a continuation of the Soviet Union, but a, a veering apart of the, the more European style, actually Slavic ethnic <coughs> republics, toward something like Poland and Hungary and the southern republics the Central Asian republics, the Caucasus, uh, towards something like Romania and Bulgaria, which were still Stalinist at that point. In other words, two different kinds of political paths, but I didn't foresee the breakup of the Soviet Union any more than anyone else did. As far as the future, that's ex so hard to tell now, especially with such a volatile administration as we have here. I mean, I think uh, what I see in Russia uh, it looks a lot like late Brezhnev to me, and I think uh, maybe U.S. policy can afford to look back on the policy that we used in the mid to late 80s, the one I described to you as Schultz's policy. Uh, identify your interests, uh, let them find out what Russian interests are, negotiate on where you can, and confront where you have to. I mean, that, that's kind of a simple formula, but I think it would uh, I think it's feasible, uh, uh, in adept as we are, we're not very nimble at these things, but it's even less now than before. Uh, and, uh, but it would capture, I think, political support uh, here. Um, but I don't know where that leads you in the future. I, I think it will probably depend on us reasserting some kind of leadership that gives us some weight for that kind of negotiation. I think it's draining out like oil out of a crankcase. I mean, why should <laughs> we ask why should we negotiate with, with them? They should ask why should they negotiate with us at this point. So some kind of reestablishment of U.S. credibility uh, and weight and intelligence and activity in the world. Uh, in Russia, some different kind of leadership approach. I mean, you're not going to hope for a Gorbachev, but some evolution of the of the Russian leadership, where it sees more advantage to that kind of a negotiation. It's going to have to be multilateral. 
it's going to be, have to be multilateral in a way that it was not uh, in the 80s and 90s. It's going to have to include Europe. It's going to have to include China. It's going to have to include many more stakeholders uh, than the U.S.-Soviet relationship. Uh, and whether you can get uh, those three conditions uh, to get something going, uh, I think we're in for a long frost. Yeah. Pablo, any other comment? Anything else? Uh, Andre okay, Andre. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, no, no. I, I think that those were uh, exhaustive uh, answers. I, I share all the assessments. One thing I would uh, say, though, about Gorbachev, that he was very lucky. Uh, pa Pablo uh, mentioned assistance. Yeah, those were really outstanding, those who mentioned. Uh, very, very educated, very smart. Uh, I mean, of course, there was Soviet kind of generation, but uh, so he was lucky. But he was particularly lucky to have an interpreter like <laughs> Pavel, because uh, we were not, we, we did not have Yeltsin and my humble self. We, we had interpreters, but not as superb as Pavel. And uh, it's second time I share panel with Pavel in recent years, and I see that he was and is not only master of the English language, superb interpreter, but a deep thinker himself. So mm. probably Gorbachev had one more uh, advisor, one more assistant, and that's why he made uh, that kind of positive change. So. Uh, yes, well, you know that um, I, I have no interest, no corruptive interest in pleasing Pavel. I don't work <laughs> under him. I worked <laughs> in the Soviet uh, in the Soviet time. Some sense for me, but now it's just let me, thank you so much. Let me suggest a, a hand for both of our guests here. <laughs> <laughs> well, a hand for our entire panel, please. Yeah. Can I just add, add just one word uh, about the future so that everyone doesn't come out of it with a pessimistic mindset? I think Tom is entirely right when he says that there should be a way of, uh, a, again, identifying areas where both sides share a common interest um, and uh, trying to work on those areas. There should be a way. Uh, we had uh, at Brookings with the Atlantic Council uh, a seminar today where we discussed the question of is there a path back to arms control? Mm -hmm. And I think there should be uh, a path back to arms control for two very simple reasons. And you'll be surprised. And they, those two very simple reasons are Putin and Trump. <laughs> I never voted for President Putin. But I can tell you, I think that for all kinds of reasons, he is interested in arms control. Mm -hmm. He wants arms control. And President Trump has written many tweets, but the most recent one was that the arms race is crazy, and that he doesn't want an arms race. There is a big distance from words to practically achieving something. But that is one area where I think uh, the US and uh, Russia could start working together, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry Tom was not at that uh, seminar, but I think that what emerged from uh, our discussion is that perhaps there is a possibility, uh, even in the coming couple of years, where my view is that at the government-to-government -government level, not much is going to happen, but uh, you know, some progress could be achieved, perhaps initially at the expert level discussions, the informal level discussions, as suggested by Schultz and Gorbachev in their Washington Post op-ed. So maybe, you know, let, let's not be too pessimistic. Yes. Well, thank thank you. you very much. Speaking yeah. of the future, yeah. I, I would uh, very much welcome Mr. Mueller. panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so you can see how really uh, some considered reflection of the past really can help us inform our considerations of the future and the present. Uh, I think it's been a fabulous panel. Uh, we, we have, uh, I think it's been stream, it's streamed and we have some recording of it. So uh, please again, join me in thanking our panel for being here today. <laughs>